Amen. You may be seated. When it comes to the subject of church history, you know that there is no end of things to read, and there is no end of things to study, and there is no end of things to think about. And every Christian should be interested in church history, should study church history, should think about church history. Today is the 31st of October. It is what we call Reformation Day. Why is it Reformation Day? Because it's believed that on this day, possibly, it was this day in 1517, that Martin Luther, a German monk, nailed some points to the door of the Wittenberg Church, objecting to, suggesting that the Church of Rome needed to reform some of its practices, particularly regarding indulgences. We have to be clear, Martin Luther had no idea the implications of that action, and indeed he was not trying to start a new church. He was not in any way intending to break away from the Roman church. He was simply seeking to see recovery of truth and reformation to the church. But the rest is history. And what a history. It is a checkered history. It is a spectacular history. It is a remarkable history. It is the account of God working through men and women by the power of His Word to bring about a recovery of the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are sitting here tonight in part because of that. If you were at the discipleship hour this morning, you would have heard Pastor Meister's excellent treatment of William Tyndale and his life, and how it is that if you have an English Bible, then you can thank God for William Tyndale, who actually gave his life that you might have the privilege of having the Bible in your own language. Martin Luther, in nailing his 95 Theses to the door of the church, was simply desiring to begin a discussion regarding certain aspects of practice in the church that he believed needed to be changed. As a result of that, of course, God began to move, and over the next 200 years or so, a mighty movement of God in Europe would be such that there would be a great recovery of apostolic doctrine, and of the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Historians like to divide the Reformation into early orthodoxy, into high orthodoxy, and into late orthodoxy. That's what I'm spending a lot of my time on right now in terms of my studies. Early orthodoxy being, of course, Martin Luther and Calvin and uh, all of those early reformers, high orthodoxy being that period that brings us into the 1600s, and particularly the writing of the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith all the way through the Dutch Reformation, and even including our own 1677, published in 1689, Baptist London Confession of Faith, and then late orthodoxy taking us up through even the life of Jonathan Edwards. Consequently, five great tenets of truth have come into existence for our benefit to help us summarize the very heart, the very soul of all that God was doing in the Protestant Reformation. We call them the five solas, the five alones, which is somewhat ironic, isn't it? Because if there's five alones, they're not alone, right? But individually, they are known as the five solas. And Pastor Steve gave us an excellent treatment this morning on sola scriptura, the recovery of the authority of the Word of God above all else with regards to matters of faith and practice. Tonight, I want to address something of sola fide, that is, faith alone. Now, boys and girls, don't worry. I'm not going to preach as long as I normally do. You're going to get your chocolate, all right? 
And I have heard that John Knox and his wife might turn up tonight across at the Ed building for some chocolate as well. So I'm watching the clock. But I want you to think about this great tenet of sola fide, faith alone, because in this great tenet, we have really the heart of the gospel message for us to consider. That is, how does a sinner gain a right standing with a holy God? Sola fide touches upon, lays out for us, addresses for us the great doctrine of justification by faith. Justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, as a result of grace alone. And I want us to think about this this evening, particularly with regards to this matter of faith. What is true faith? Martin Luther declared regarding justification by faith alone that it is the article by which the church stands without which it falls. What he really meant by that was this, that the gospel, the true gospel of Christ that sets before us how a sinner is to be made right with God, that is the article that causes the church to stand. But if the church doesn't have the gospel, then it ceases to be the church, and it falls. That's why we are so committed here to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ must be understood. It must be preached. It must be applied to our lives, because without it, we are not Christian at all. There is no Christianity without Jesus Christ. And Martin Luther understood this. And as Martin Luther nailed his thesis to uh, the door of the Wittenberg church, he hadn't worked out all of his theology at that point. Indeed, if you compare his early Galatians commentary with his later Galatians commentary, there are some differences that he makes, and you see some evidences of progress in his thinking. That's encouraging to me, because that means that, like you and like me, we don't get our understanding of all the truth all at once. We have to grow. If it was good enough for Martin Luther, then it's good enough for us, isn't it? And tonight, as we think about this sola fide, this saving faith, this faith alone, as it pertains particularly then to how then we become right with God, I want us to think specifically tonight on the matter of saving faith from a very well-known text. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 1. And I want us to think about what John writes here in verses 11 and 12, and I want to draw out from these two verses three truths pertaining to saving faith. And hopefully, it will help you tonight to evaluate your own life, your own experience before God regarding the nature of the faith that you say that you have, right? There are a lot of people today who will say they have faith, right? You hear it on the news, you hear them interview, oh, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. And I always ask myself, what kind of faith do they have and what are they trusting in? Right? Because does it bring them into a right relationship with God? Does it deal with their deepest problem, which is their sins? Does it bring them to a place of peace with God and reconciliation with God? We need to examine this. We need to think about this. We need to consider this. In our own London Baptist Confession of Faith, our forefathers in chapter 14 lay out the subject of saving faith. It comes three or four chapters after chapter 11 that addresses the doctrine of justification. And it's important for us as Christians that we would understand then, when we think of this sola fide, this faith alone, that we understand its relevance for our lives, as well as its place in the history of the Reformation. And to help you do that tonight, I want you to think about this text with me for a few moments. John writes this, Jesus came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, Jesus gave the right to become children of God. Boys and girls, I have three points tonight, quite simply, that we would understand what 
true saving faith is all about. First of all, I want you to see from our text the act of faith. The act of faith. Because here in our text, it's very important for us to observe how it is that John lays this out for us. Now, as we think about the act of faith here, we need to think about what John is saying and where John is saying it. This, this gospel of John is not exactly the same as the other three gospels. Uh, we talk about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? They're more parallel in terms of the events that they record. John's gospel is a bit different in the way that it's structured, and certainly in terms of its emphasis regarding its message. But I want you to notice that here in John chapter 1, looking at verses 11 and 12, we find that this statement is right at the heart of what we call the prologue to the book. The prologue, the introduction to the gospel. Now, in this introduction, it's very interesting that John is introducing us to God the Son. And notice how he does it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. You notice distinctions that are being made there? regarding the Godhead. You notice that John wants us to understand something of the unique identity of the one who is the Word who was with God and the one who is the Word who was God. And notice when you jump down to verse 14 what he tells us, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John is introducing us to the second person of the Godhead. John is introducing us here to God the Son who becomes flesh, and he's introducing us here to him in this prologue, and then the rest of his gospel is going to talk about his life in the flesh on the earth, doing the will of the Father. And when you get to the end of the book, John tells us why he writes this gospel. And we need to think about that for a moment before we get to the act of faith. Notice what John says in John 20, verse 30. It's always good to know something of the purpose of a book when we're studying it. Not always easy to ascertain, but here John actually tells us in John 20, verse 30, why this book has been written by him, why he actually recorded what he did about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. That tells you straight away that John is selective in what he chooses to put into the gospel, and that he's under the inspiration of the Spirit selecting specific elements of our Lord's life for our instruction. Notice verse 31, but these were written, that is what I have written, and there are seven I am's, boys and girls. You can go and study them out for yourself in this gospel that are well look, worth looking at. These are written, why? What is his whole purpose in writing this gospel? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Why does John write his gospel? So that you would believe in Jesus. And by believing in Jesus, you would have life in His name. In other words, John's gospel is all about the importance then of faith in Christ. It's all about the importance of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as we come then to this text in John 1, we see that it's in the part of the, the, the gospel that is introducing Jesus to us, and we see that it's in this book that is designed by God through John to teach us about Jesus, that we might believe in Jesus. Well, let's look at what John tells us here about faith, what he tells us about faith. Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want you to notice, first of all, here, as we look at the act of saving faith, I want you to notice the contrast in this text. Do you see the contrast? It's between those who did not receive him and those who did receive him. To help us understand what the act of faith is really all about, John contrasts not receiving Christ with receiving Christ. Now, we have to think this through. We have to consider for a moment, then, what does it mean to not receive Christ? And what does it mean to receive Christ? Because John is telling us historically about what happened when Jesus came into the world and when Jesus grew up and began to proclaim the truth of God and do the signs and the wonders that He did to display who He was, John says to us, Well, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. If you don't receive something, what are you doing? You're rejecting it, right? You're refusing to take it, right? Someone brings you an Amazon parcel, right? And uh, we all have Amazon nowadays, don't we? Nobody shops anymore. We just order on Amazon, right? Amazon parcel, door knocks, uh, the, the person's rung your bell, and they're off, and you pick it up, and it's not your name, you realize it's your neighbor. Well, what, what do you do? You don't receive it. You shout on them, hey, I'm not taking this, right? You have it and send it on. I'm not receiving this. This isn't something I want. It's not something I've ordered. It's not something I will take. John says here that when Jesus came into the world, and He came in in fulfillment to the promises of God and the covenants of God. What do we find? We find then that He came to His own people. He came to Israel, and they did not receive Him. They did not receive Him. They did not take Him as their Messiah. They did not take Him as their Savior. And He's speaking to us here in contrast with those who did receive Him. Notice the conjunction there in verse 12, but to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. What is the act of faith? What does it involve? It involves a receiving of Christ, an embracing of Christ to ourselves, for ourselves. But notice how John puts it. Receiving Him, believing in His name, it involves being persuaded of who He is. It involves understanding of who He is. It involves trusting in who He is. And so, when we think of this act of faith that we declare in sola fide, right, and and faith alone, we must understand here that we're talking about that which in the soul, in our own hearts, receives, and our own hearts is persuaded, and our own hearts is accepting of Jesus. Very important for us to grasp. Very important for us to see, right? This issue of having confidence in, being persuaded about, is all part of the act of faith. There were those who were not persuaded of who Jesus was, They were not convinced of who Jesus was. They were not trusting of who Jesus was. And so they did not receive him. But on contrast, those who believed, those who who possessed faith, they were persuaded. They did believe. They did trust. They did accept him and take him to themselves. So when you think about your faith, right, you're thinking about something that the Spirit has done in your heart to cause you, to cause you to receive Jesus for yourself, to be persuaded intellectually, to be stirred, as it were, affectionately, to be caused volitionally to trust in Jesus. And John makes it very clear here at the outset of his gospel that this Jesus that he's speaking of, this Jesus is a divisive figure in this sense. There are going to be those who will receive him, and there are going to be those who will not receive him. And I think it's important for us to understand tonight that it's not changed, has it? Here we are, thousands of years later, and it's exactly the same today. There are only two kinds of people in the world. 
There are those who do not receive Christ, and there are those who receive Christ. There are only two kinds of people in here tonight. There are those who, have, who, do, who will not receive Christ, and there are those who will receive Christ. There are those who are not persuaded and will not take Him to themselves for, for salvation, and there are those who are persuaded, and they do take Him to themselves. There are the unbelieving, and there are the believing. And so, when we think of this act of faith, when we think of, well, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means taking Christ to ourselves, understanding who He is, understanding uh, what, he, what He does, and, and, and resting in Him for ourselves. And that brings us to the second main issue then, and that is the object of saving faith, which of course already we understand is Christ Himself. And this is important for us to see in this whole matter of sola fide. Why? Because it's not your faith that saves you. It's Jesus that saves you. It's not your faith. And this is one of the challenges, I think, sometimes for us as Christians. Do I have enough faith? It's my faith, the faith that it needs to be. Now, I understand. I've, got, I've been there. I've struggled with assurance of faith, right? But here's the issue. Notice very clearly the emphasis in the text. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God. What, what, where's the emphasis in the text? It's in Jesus, right? Jesus Himself, right? And so, when we think of this issue of faith, we must think of what faith is does, right? The action of faith, that is, taking to ourselves our Lord. But we've got to think more deeply than that. We've got to think of taking Christ to ourselves, taking Him who is God come in the flesh to ourselves, believing in His name. What does that mean? Believing in who He is, right? Well, who is Jesus? Well, John is describing here very clearly for us that He is God come in the flesh, right? But he also tells us something very interesting a little bit later in the prologue, verse 17, if you look there just for a moment. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's a historical, chronological statement, right? The law was given through Moses. Thousands of years before God came into the world in the person of Jesus, the law was given, right? The law was given because of sin. We know that from the Scriptures. The law was given to guide Israel to Christ, to bring them to their Messiah. But here's something the law could never do. It could never make them right with God. It could never deal with their greatest problem. What was their greatest problem? Their guilt in Adam before their holy Creator, their corruption of nature as a result of their forefathers' disobedience to God. And so, all of the law that they were given, all of the commands that they were given, no matter how much they tried to keep them, they were never going to deal with their, their guilt before God in Adam and their corrupt nature. In other words, their sin. And of course, the Apostle Paul in his great chapter in Romans 3 tells us that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, right? There's no justification, there's no acceptance with God by keeping God's law. But it was never designed for us that we would keep the law and so be justified. It was given historically to Israel at a time when God was constituting the nation under Moses so that the promise of the, of the seed of the woman would be protected, so that the covenants would be established, so that the fulfillment of God's purpose in Christ would come to pass. And so what happens when Jesus comes? Well, John tells us. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. It's not that there was no grace and no truth in the Mosaic period, but grace and truth in terms of salvation, in terms of justification, in terms of forgiveness for sins and peace with God, they are only cured and only established through the person and work of Jesus. All the promises of the Old Testament were pointing to Jesus. 
The only way you could be justified in the Old Testament was not by going up and offering your sacrifices at the temple and keeping the law. No, but rather by believing the promises that were attached regarding the one who would come and who would address the issue of guilt in Adam and corruption of nature. The reality is this, that Jesus is the only grounds for our peace with God and our pardon from sin and our righteousness before our Father. And this is why when we think about the issue of faith, we've got to be very careful here that we don't give the wrong impression, right? Faith, in chapter 11 of our confession, it stated that faith is the sole instrument by which Christ is received by us, right? Faith is not a work, right? Faith was a work, we'd be in trouble, right? No, faith takes hold of the work that Jesus has done on our behalf. Faith takes hold of Jesus Christ, the God-man who has lived for us and died for us and risen for us and ascended for us and is praying and interceding for us and is coming again for us. Faith takes hold of Him to ourselves, to our hearts, and appropriates to our souls who He is and what He has accomplished. And brothers and sisters, you know as well as I do that that's something you're doing all the time, every day, right? It's not like, well, I, I did that 10 years ago, and somehow or another that keeps me going all the time, right? No, your, your faith, yes, when you first trusted in Christ 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you were made right with God, but what do you do every day? You look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, you appropriate afresh who He is, what He's done, your justification is secure, your sanctification is progressing, and as we're going to see in a minute, you have this great blessing of being a child of God because of Jesus. But it's so important to understand here very clearly that uh, the, the grounds of your justification, your grounds of your acceptance with God is not your faith, but it's the one that your faith takes hold of. Jesus. Jesus. And that's why Paul, that's why John writes the way he does. He says here, Jesus came to his own, his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, to all who did believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And here's the third thing we want to look at. We see here the fruit of faith, or the benefit of faith from this text. Now, there are more than, there's more than one benefit, of course, with regards to our faith in Jesus, but here is the very pinnacle, here is the very zenith, here is the very high point of believing in Jesus. What is it? The blessing of adoption. Adoption. Boys and girls, if you're learning the catechism, you will know uh, that there are three blessings, right, that come through believing in Jesus. Justification, sanctification, and adoption. Here, John mentions adoption. John tells us very clearly that all who receive Christ, take Christ to themselves, being persuaded in their minds regarding His identity, being drawn out in their affections towards Him because of his, who He is, and, and trusting in Him for the forgiveness of their sins and peace with God, all who, who believe in His name because of who He is, the Lord of glory that has been given all power by the Father, he, he gives us the right to become children of God. Now, it's very necessary to point out that Jesus is the Son of God, and that God the Son is the Son by eternal generation, right? So, He has always been the Son eternally. But in terms of him by nature being the Son of God, we, we are made children of God by grace. We are made children of God by the adopting power of the Holy Spirit. You and I, because of our first parents, we're born into this world as children of wrath, children of the devil, right? We are of the evil one until we are 
brought from death to life into the kingdom of God. And we need to understand then that Jesus has the power, Jesus has the authority given to Him by the Father as a result of God's covenant purpose through the Son. He has the power, as we believe in Him, to make us children of God. And how does He do that? By the work of the Spirit, through the truth of His Word. That's why Paul will write in Romans 10, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's why the Word of God is so important. That's why Sola Scriptura was the first tenet of the Reformation, right? Without the Word of God, we've got no knowledge of God. We've got no knowledge of the gospel. We've got no knowledge of salvation, right? We need the, God. We need the Word of God. But then as we get into the Word of God, what does the Word of God reveal? God in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, calling us to believe in Christ by grace, through faith, unto the glory of God. And here's the blessing of grace stated for us in our text. Jesus gave the right to become children of God to all who believe in Him. Do you want to be a child of God? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be persuaded in your mind by way of the knowledge of the Word of God that Jesus is who He is, and He does what He does because of who He is. That He is God come in the flesh to fulfill all righteousness. That's what you have in the Gospels, that the life of Christ being lived out in submission and obedience to the Father to fulfill all righteousness for us, on our behalf. Why? Because we cannot do it for ourselves. And then recognize that it culminates in His death and the shedding of His blood. Why did He shed His blood? The Bible tells us to make atonement for sin, to propitiate, to satisfy divine justice so that we might receive pardon and that we might go free. But more than that, that we might be viewed by God as righteous in Him. You see, the doctrine of justification is not just about your pardon. It is about that, but it's much more than that. It's about your righteousness. A righteousness that God has provided in Jesus Christ's life. And so when you're reading the Gospels, you should be reading the Gospels saying, this was for me. This was for me. This was for me. This was for me. Fulfilling all righteousness so that the righteousness of Christ, God might take and give to you as you trust in Christ and as He is the one who has bore your sins in His own body on the tree. It's vitally important to recognize that He gives you pardon. He gives you standing with God as a child of God. He gives you His Spirit to give you power to live as a child of God to live as a child of God. This is why when we talk about conversion as though it's really not really changed anything, we don't understand the true nature of grace, and we don't understand the true nature of conversion. Of course, it's changed everything. It's changed everything. You're now right with God where you were not right with God. You're now accepted by God where you were not accepted by God. You have now got the power to live for the glory of God where before you had no interest in even thinking about it. And so as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you the right to be a child of God, adopted into His family. So as you think about this tonight, I want to ask you this evening, what is the grounds of your hope for acceptance with God? What is the grounds of your hope for the forgiveness of your sins? the grounds of your hope for peace with God and eternal life. It must be Jesus Christ and Him alone, for He is the only grounds of our justification before our God. So, you might be saying tonight, well, pastor, I'm struggling with the assurance of faith. Do I have enough faith? It's not about that you have enough faith. Even the weakest of faith Taking hold of Jesus brings you salvation. It's about, do you believe in Jesus? Are you persuaded intellectually 
by the revelation of the Word of God that God in Christ has come into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. And that in Jesus Christ, all that is needed to be done for you to be forgiven for your sins and made right with God has been done by Him. So, I don't understand it all. I didn't ask you how much you understood, right? We're all still growing in our knowledge. I asked you, do you know enough to say, I believe? I believe. Is it the case that you can truly assent in your soul, in your heart, to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done? Is it the case that you are actually persuaded that you receive Him to yourself to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to be your salvation? You say, well, I've got so much I don't get. I understand. But that's what the Spirit of God does as you apply yourself to the Word of God. Your faith will grow. Your faith will be informed more and more about who He is and what He has done. But it's not about the strength of your faith. It's about the strength of the Savior who saves you as you trust Him. And I want to encourage you this evening. I know some of you struggle with assurance. Look away from your faith to the object of your faith and see in Him everything you need for the forgiveness of your sins and peace with God. It is Christ and Christ alone that this faith and this faith alone takes hold of in order for us to be right with God. The hope, the hope of our souls tonight, brothers and sisters, must be in Christ and in Christ alone. The faith alone that saves is never alone, of course. It issues forth in the life of a faithful Christian, a sincere Christian, right? But the faith alone that saves is taking hold of the Christ alone that saves, because it is Christ alone that brings us into a right relationship with God. When I was at high school, I used to play rugby, and one of the things they taught us when we were playing rugby was how to receive the ball, right? And if you didn't learn how to receive the ball properly, in a game, you would drop it, right? And then you would get nicknamed Butterfingers, right? But there was a knack, right, in how the ball would be, if it was passed to you, how you had to receive it. And they would always teach us to receive it into our chest, right? So that we could grip the ball and go forward. Learning how to receive was critical to playing the game well. When it comes to our Christian faith, right? When it comes to the issue of receiving Christ, receiving Christ is simply this, that you are trusting yourself to Him for the forgiveness of your sins and peace with God. There's nothing complicated about that, right? It is that you recognize that you're a sinner and yet you're at enmity with God and you can't save yourself, but you recognize that God in Christ has done a marvelous work in order to rescue you and save you. And so by trusting in Him, all that He has done and all the benefits of what He has accomplished, they become yours through that sole instrument of the hand that receives the Savior from sin. Boys and girls, don't overcomplicate it. You say, well, pastor, I need to know all this theology. No, don't overcomplicate it. Trust in Jesus Christ, who is God come in the flesh for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll be saved. You'll be saved. Trust in Him who has fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf by keeping the law, and who has made atonement for our sins through His shed blood, and who has risen from the dead for us. Trust in Him and you'll be saved. You'll be saved. You see, the gospel, the gospel is good news because it tells you something you need to know, and that is you can't save yourself, but God's done everything that's necessary in order for you to be saved in His Son. Don't trust yourself. Trust Him. 
believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive Him. Take Him to yourself. And He, He will make you a child of God. For those of us who are Christians tonight, we know it to be true, don't we? We know that when we first trusted in Christ, we didn't understand so much, but we knew that we were sinners. We knew that we needed to be saved. We knew that only Christ could save us, and we trusted in Him, and we found peace with God. Forgiveness for our sins. Our consciences were dealt with. Our guilt was dealt with. New life was received. We know that over the years we've grown in our understanding, and we're still growing in our understanding. Our faith is something that grows. But nevertheless, we have found them not to be a disappointment, have we? It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are made right with God. And even though in 1547, the Roman Catholic Council of Trent tried to declare that justification was by faith and works. It didn't perturb the reformers. They stood their ground, and they maintained that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And here we are tonight, brothers and sisters, and we have this great heritage. We have this great message. We need to take it to the world, recognizing that as we hold fast to these solas, as we agree with Martin Luther in this article of the church, we also understand that it is indeed what God says it is. The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. May it be tonight, brothers and sisters, that we would be the just who live by faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we think upon your grace, as we marvel at the revelation of your word to us regarding your Son, we acknowledge that apart from Jesus Christ, we would be lost. We thank you that your Son has come into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. We thank you that through receiving Him to our souls, through trusting in Him for who He is and what He has done, we find you to be true. We receive the forgiveness of our sins and peace with you. We enjoy the blessedness not only of justification and sanctification, but the wonder of adoption into your family. Father, we pray now that you would write your word on each one of our hearts. We pray that we might enjoy fellowship together even this evening. We pray, Lord, as we move into this week, that we would be a people who are looking unto Jesus, to Jesus alone, for the forgiveness of our sins and peace with you and the power to live in a way that brings honor to your name as those who are children of the living God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.